the Palestine Papers, an Al Jazeera investigation. The police state of Palestine, evidence the Palestinian Authority has killed its own people. The MI6 covert plan, the plot to crush Hamas, the PA's political enemy. And muzzling the mosques, how and why the PA silenced the sermons Israel didn't want Palestinians to hear. Hello, I'm Adrian Finnegan, and this is Al Jazeera's third release of the Palestine Papers. Now, the confidential documents going online at this moment stand out from the rest. We've already told you details of peace negotiations that you were never meant to hear. This time, we reveal stunning evidence of the deep collaboration between Israel and the Palestinian Authority security forces, a connection so close that the PA was copied in on Israel's plans to kill a Fatah member. Also on this program, proof of a plot by the British spy agency MI6 to help both Israel and the PA undermine Hamas. We begin with Mike Hanna and the clandestine security pact between old enemies that surfaced in the Palestine Papers. <laughs> A daughter whose father has gone, and the family of Hassan Madun will never forget that November day when he was killed by an Israeli missile. But while the Israelis carried out the attack, the Palestine papers indicate the Palestinian Authority was involved in discussions about his killing. The Al-Aqsa Brigade's member was apparently marked as a target at a meeting of Israeli and Palestinian ministers. Hassan Madun was known to be vehemently opposed to any collaboration with Israel. Hassan Madun, we know his address and Rashid Abu Shwak knows that. Why don't you kill him? We gave instruction to Rashid and we'll see. The specific instructions given to Rashid Abu Shwak, a Palestinian security chief, are not known. But within a matter of months after the meeting, Madun was killed. The al Martyrs Brigade, to which he belonged, was gradually assimilated into the Palestinian Authority's security forces, which increasingly became occupied more with eradicating the PA's political rival Hamas than resisting Israel. We'll defeat Hamas if we reach an agreement. And this will be our response to their claim that gaining back our land can be achieved through resistance only. We continue with a genuine process. Reaching an agreement is a matter of survival for us. It's the way to defeat Hamas. The US, which lists Hamas as a terrorist organization, poured vast amounts of money into training and equipping the Palestinian Authority security forces. And Palestinian security officers were happy to ask the Israelis for weapons that had been used against them in the past. There's also the request for tear gas canisters. You previously gave us these back in 96. What do you need them for? Riot control. We want to avoid the situation where the security agencies may be forced to fire on unarmed civilians. The crowd control methods of the Palestinian security forces became increasingly hardline, and the US military that had played a role in training them gave a mixed report. On one level, praise for the quality of intelligence that was being provided, but concern expressed about the methods used to obtain it. By the way, the intelligence guys are good. The Israelis like them. They say they are giving as much as they are taking from them. But they are causing some problems for international donors because they are torturing people. Hamas does it. <laughs> That's not an excuse. The Palestinian Authority, though, was intent on demonstrating it would maintain what it called order. But the cost was high. We have had to kill Palestinians to establish one authority, one gun, and the rule of law. We continue to perform our obligations. We have invested time and effort, and even killed our own people 
to maintain order and the rule of law. Here in a Gaza that remains under Israeli siege, the words of Palestinian negotiators in the West Bank appear deeply remote. But the Palestine papers reveal the extent to which all Palestinians are held hostage to what is called a negotiating process, regardless of where they live. And regardless of who was ultimately responsible for the death of Hassan Madun, it's clear now he was not necessarily a victim of the conflict, but of the purported attempts to negotiate an end to it. Mike Hanna, Al Jazeera, Gaza. Well, Al Jazeera's Shireen Tandros has been following this story, and she joins us now live from Gaza. Shireen, the PA clearly knew that Israel was targeting Hassan Madhun. What did they do about it? Well, according to sources within the Aqsa Martyrs Brigades, which we've been speaking to, the Palestinian Authority warned on at least two occasions Hassan Madhun that he was high on Israel's hit list and urged him to stop his activities against Israel. In fact, they said to him that if he was to stop these activities, then they could provide some kind of protection to him and negotiate that with the Israeli side. But uh, we understand that Hassan Madhun uh, did, not, uh, did not accept that offer. And we've also been speaking to his family here in Gaza. They say that uh, blame first and foremost lies uh, on uh, Israel's doorstep for this uh, attack, for the missile strike that ended uh, up killing Hassan Madhun. But they do say that in 2005, at the time of his death, there were many rumors circulating uh, about uh, so-called collaborators uh, that were involved in this particular hit. Shireen, what sort of reaction is this news likely to trigger there in Gaza? Well, Hassan Madhun uh, was a very well-known figure. He was an important uh, person within the Aqsa Brigades, also an important person within the Palestinian security forces. I don't think there'll be a lot of shock uh, amongst most Palestinians here that the Palestinian Authority knew something about this assassination. I think the question that Palestinians will have once they read these documents is just how far uh, the Palestinian Authority knew, how much did they know about the planning and the execution of this particular hit. All right, Shireen, many thanks indeed. Uh, Shireen Tadros there, live in Gaza. Well, since we began to publish the Palestine papers, we've been trying to get reaction from the Israeli government. Uh, so far, no response. We'll let you know if and when we get one. Now, Abdul Bari Atwan is editor in chief of Al Quds Al Arabi newspaper in London. He joins me now in the studio. Abdul Bari Atwan, let me quote to you uh, from the papers. We heard this quote just a moment ago in Mike Hanna's report. Saib Barakat talking yes. to U.S. diplomat David Hale. We've had to kill Palestinians to establish one authority, one gun, and the rule of law. We continue to perform our obligations. What's your reaction to that? Shocking. I am absolutely shocked. A Palestinian official admitting that he is killing his own people to keep the authority, to keep the one gun, and this gun actually is collaborating with the Israeli security in order to keep law and order. What kind of law and order he is keeping by killing his own people? I think this is, this is really very, very shocking and very humiliating to the Palestinian people. Given the level of cooperation that's evidenced uh, by the papers, if the PA knew about Hassan Madhun, then it, it doesn't require too much of a jump to imagine that they might have known about others on Israel's hit list, does it? W what else might they have known? Well, actually, definitely, they have this hit list. And we don't know, in the paper, we knew about Hassan al-Madhun, uh, the, you know, um, Nasser Yusuf, the chief uh, security man in, in the Palestinian Authority, gave instruction to Rashid Abu Shbak, the man who in charge of the preventative uh, forces in Gaza, to liquidate um, Hassan al-Madhun. So it is written on the wall. It seems, you know, he was liquidated. He was actually assassinated by, by the Palestinian Authority. We, we, we must find facts about it. And this, this is the man of Fatah. He is of Al-Aqsa Matar Brigade, which actually was established by Yasser Arafat and which actually uh, consists of uh, Fatah people. So if this man was killed by his own authority, by his own leadership, what can you call that? I think this is scandalous. So the, the PA claims to be the official representative of all Palestinians, and yet on this evidence, mm. they've turned their guns on their own people. How will Palestinians take that news? How will, will, will your readers across the Arab world take that news? 
Well, actually, uh, as I said, they will be shocked. This is very, very alarming to the Palestinian people. This authority is saying we represent the Palestinian people. We are talking in behalf of the Palestinian people. So if, you know, they are killing the people, they are talking in behalf of them, they are representing them, this, this, is, this is very, very scandalous again. And uh, what I noticed, actually, through all this, that, you know, the major aim of the Palestinian Authority security forces is to fight Hamas not to fight the Israeli. They are working with the Israeli against you know, their own people. Hamas is, is a Palestinian organization. Members of Hamas also are Palestinian. So if you are collaborating with the Israeli against Hamas, you are collaborating with the Israeli against your own people. And Hamas is a resistance group, whether Fatah like it or not, whether the authority like it or not. So it seems the struggle of the authority is to fight the Palestinian, to fight the Palestinian who are against the Israeli, not who are against the authority itself. So what kind of law and order, what kind of actually strategic aim of the Palestinian authority in, in this case? All right, we'll leave it there. For the moment, uh, Abdul Bariat won many thanks. Well, joining us now is General Adnan Al-Damiri, a spokesperson for the Palestinian Security Services. So let me quote to you from the papers. Shaul Mofaz says to Nasser Youssef, the PA Minister of Interior, we know his address, and Rashid Abu Shabak knows that. Why don't you kill him? Nasser Youssef replies, we gave instructions to Rashid, and we'll see. Did the Palestinian Authority Security Services play any role in the killing of Hassan Madhoun, the man featured in our report? First of all, I don't know where they had uh, bring, brought uh, these uh, recordings from. Second, and I also don't know uh, what are they talking about really. But what I can say is that the security forces of Palestine have not contributed or did not take part at any time in uh, arresting or killing any Palestinian for uh, the uh, service or interest of the Israelis. There is some exaggeration for political purposes, exaggeration in order to attack the authority by political rivals. So the documents show that there were many occasions when there was a high level of cooperation uh, with the, the Israeli security services. You're stating categorically here and now that this cooperation did not lead to the killing of any Palestinians. We are a small new force, security force, and we live under occupation. And we don't control the air nor the borders. We have connections uh, and communications with the Israelis for the interest of our people. Let me read to you uh, what Saeb Arakat says in the papers. We have had to kill Palestinians to establish one authority, one gun, and the rule of law. We continue to perform our obligations. What do you say to that? I don't think Dr. Sa Saeb Arakat or any Palestinian can possibly say such words. Uh, the Palestinian blood uh, was shed uh, by Hamas itself only and not by the authority, Palestinian authority. All right, uh, General, we'll, we'll leave it there for the moment. Uh, many thanks indeed, General Adnan al-Damiri. Uh, now, to help us uh, analyze the latest revelations from the Palestine Papers, we've assembled a panel of international experts. Joining us live from Tel Aviv, Akiva Eldar, the chief political columnist at the Israeli national da daily newspaper Haaretz. From Beirut, Alistair Crook, a former European Union mediator in the Middle East and an expert on British intelligence there and uh, Mark Perry, a foreign policy analyst who joins us live from Washington, D.C. Alistair Crook, let's start with you. Do these revelations suggest a shift in the mindset of the, PL, uh, the PA and the PLO? They, they seem to have gone from fighting for a homeland to fighting for their continued political supremacy. They seem to be obsessed with Hamas. So the papers show that that involves a, a good degree of cooperation with Israel. Yes, this is right. Uh, I think the turning point did come in 2003, and uh, the Palestine papers show that there was a big shift in the decisions of the British government and indeed other European states to, if you like, enter the conflict, an internal Palestinian conflict, on the side of one party against the other party. And in the words of some of the documents, 
is to, to destroy and uh, dismantle the command and the communications of this group, even perhaps to the extent of, of, of interning them. Uh, but this was a process that then developed, and it became part of a strategy which was to divide the Palestinians. The moderates who were to be supported, the extremists who to, were to be hollowed out uh, and weakened. It fitted in with the American language, the American rhetoric of the war on terror uh, at the time. But after Gaza was, um, after Hamas took control in Gaza, of course it, it became much more serious. It became a conflict, and indeed uh, in 2009, uh, General Farage. Uh, was saying to the Israelis very clearly, Hamas is our enemy. It's Hamas, it's the enemy. We put all our cards on the table. And he said, you made a truce with Hamas. We did not. So I think it was very clear that we see a big shift. And it becomes Hamas is the enemy. And this is part of a process, a very elaborate process then, uh, by which the Palestinian security services from 2003 onward increasingly became the arm uh, of the Israeli security services. All right. Let, let's, let's Israelis were selecting the people. Yeah. Uh, they were largely directing them, too. All right. Let's, let's bring in Mark Perry in, in Washington, D.C. Mark, I, I saw you nodding in, a, in agreement with at least some of that. Does this level of cooperation documented in the papers surprise you? Is, the any, is there anything here that, that, that we didn't know previously? Uh, on, on the one hand, it doesn't surprise me. On, on the other hand, if you see it in black and white, it's really quite explosive. We have here firsthand evidence of uh, Palestinian cooperation uh, with the Israeli security services. And, and let's not kid ourselves. If you walk into the commander of the National Security Force, his office, there's a phone on his desk that's linked to the Shin Bet. There is, there is absolute cooperation between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And, and, and one more point that I think is important here, we're not simply talking about the imposition of law and order. We'd all agree with that. What we have happening in the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank today is the, is the criminalization of political dissent, the arrest of people for their political beliefs. That's how far this has gone. And I'm sad to say it as, as an American, the head, of the, the head of the trainers and the person who oversaw this was Keith Dayton. And, and he is a, he's, a, he's been a party to this. It's, it's really, uh, if you look at this in the, Pal in the, in the Palestine papers, it's, it's, uh, it's quite sobering. Okay, Mark, we'll, we'll explore uh, that avenue a, a, a little more uh, later in, in the program. Akiva Elder, uh, do you think that your readers, ordinary Israelis, would be surprised to learn at the level, uh, of the level of cooperation between the Israeli and Palestinian security services? Well, I hope that they would appreciate it because they look at it as a zero-sum game, uh, which means uh, if the Palestinians contain terrorism, we, the Israelis, um, feel much more comfortable on, on buses and uh, in, in the shopping malls. Uh, actually, I heard just two days ago General Amos Gilad, who is the chief uh, military and political coordinator uh, in the uh, Ministry of Defense, who um, said that the Israelis don't appreciate enough what the Palestinians are doing for their security. Now, you know, it, it reminds me, uh, it, it brings me back to uh, the 47-48 uh, uh, confrontation between um, the Haganah against the Irgun, the uh, Stern Gang, the uh, Israeli so-called uh, terrorists, uh, because uh, at that time, Israel wanted to prove that it can contain terrorism and it deserves to uh, receive a state. Now, my problem is with the trade-off. The trade-off was supposed to be the Palestinians will contain terrorism and the Israelis will contain the uh, settlements. And uh, this is what is missing in this puzzle. I think if you look at the roadmap, the Palestinians did what they uh, were committed to do, which is uh, to show that they are doing their best uh, to uh, remove the terrorists and to contain Hamas. Uh, and the Israelis, in return, were supposed uh, to uh, offer the Palestinian um, their hand for serious negotiations on final status and to remove all illegal outposts 
and uh, uh, freeze all the, uh, the expansion of the settlements. All right. And uh, uh, I think the message is very clear to the, con to the international community and uh, uh, mainly to the Americans. Where are you? Where, where, what are you doing in order to balance those two? Okay, uh, gentlemen, for the moment, many thanks. A good time to remind you that uh, Al Jazeera is putting all the Palestine papers online. Everything we've reported so far is there right now. Just go to transparency.aljazeera.net and follow the instructions. And uh, please do keep an eye out for more papers to come. Next on the Palestine Papers, revelations on rendition. How Britain's secret service offered to help push the peace process along by abducting key Hamas figures. Barnaby Phillips reports. The year 2003. Israel and the occupied territories in the grip of the Second Intifada. A secret plan was presented by British intelligence to the Palestinian Authority security forces to help them control radical groups and thus reassure the Israelis. Degrading the capabilities of the rejectionists, Hamas, PIJ and the Al-Aqsa brigades through the disruption of their leadership's communications and command and control capabilities, the detention of key middle-ranking officers, and the confiscation of their arsenals and financial resources held within the occupied territories. U.S. and informally U.K. monitors would report both to Israel and the Quartet. We could also explore the temporary internment of leading Hamas and PIJ figures, making sure they're well treated with EU funding. This is London, and those are the headquarters of British intelligence, MI6. Now, we don't know to what extent those extraordinary and illegal ideas were actually adopted, but we do have evidence of further links between British intelligence and the Palestinian security establishment. This is a confidential British document from 2005. It shows funding for Palestinian police training centers, but it also appears to show British money paying for offices and computers for two other organizations, the General Intelligence and Preventative Security Services. Both those organizations have been accused repeatedly of using torture against political opponents of the Palestinian Authority. This man was tortured by the Preventative Security Services in 2009. He's a shopkeeper suspected of belonging to Hamas. This video, one of many testimonies collected by a human rights group. I was interrogated for 95 days, 30 days in Qalqilia and 65 days in Betonia. Like the other prisoners, I was tortured in several ways. The guards beat me with their arms, legs, and sticks all over my body, and especially my face. Now it's public knowledge that Britain has been at the forefront of an EU program to train the Palestinian security forces. It was launched when Tony Blair was Prime Minister. Today, of course, he's a Middle East peace envoy, struggling to be seen as an honest broker. Now, these documents suggest his government had a deeper, murkier involvement in Palestinian politics. That plan then, drafted by Britain's Secret Service, was passed to David Craig, listed as a political consul at the British Consulate in Jerusalem. He, in turn, handed it to a man called Jibril Rajoub, a senior security official with the Palestinian Authority. So let's get more now from... Barnaby Phillips, who joins us live from the MI6 headquarters uh, in London right now. So, Barnaby, has there been any uh, response from the British Foreign Office to what we've found in the Palestine Papers? There has been some, Adrian. They said, and this is completely standard, that they would not quote on intelligence matters, but in relation to the human rights allegations uh, and British in involvement there, uh, they released a statement just a very short time ago. Let me read it to you. The UK absolutely condemns any abuse of human rights. We take allegations of human rights abuses extremely seriously and are studying reports carefully. Minister Burt, that's Alistair Burt, a junior minister in the Foreign Minister, raised the issue of human rights when he met Prime Minister Fayyad last week. He was visiting the Palestinian territories and asked for a concrete assurance that allegations would be investigated and appropriate action taken. 
The Prime Minister gave this, noting that the Palestinian Authority was addressing this issue, not just as a result of international pressure, but because he, the Prime Minister, had a deep personal conviction that human rights should be respected and should be at the heart of a future Palestinian state. In general terms, what, British author what the British authorities are saying that they have, is that they have tried to play a constructive nation-building role, if you like. However, the implications of those documents, which you heard in my package just before there, uh, imply that their involvement was deeper and perhaps not always so constructive. Barnaby, that's the, the MI6 uh, headquarter building uh, uh, right over your shoulder there. Uh, uh, what more can you tell us then uh, about this, uh, this MI6 plan? Well, we, 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 we believe it dated from 2003. Let's go back to 2003. What was happening in the world? Well, Iraq was being invaded by the United States and by Britain together. They were extremely close. What intelligence sources tell me is that this kind of plan would have had to have been drawn up at a very high level, not just on the ground uh, out there uh, in, in Jerusalem, but there would have been serious involvement back here in the United Kingdom itself. And, of course, the United Kingdom was close to America. They were closer to Israel. This is the kind of action that Israel would like to have been, uh, been uh, seen being taken against Hamas, uh, and I believe that it would have caused serious friction uh, between Britain and its European Union partners on the ground. Barnaby, uh, help us to, to, to understand what sort of reaction uh, this uh, is likely to garner, uh, both politically there in, in Britain and uh, among the British public. Well, I talked about Tony Blair being a peace envoy there, Adrian, and how this presents him uh, with difficulties in, in his job, because these documents relate back to the time, of course, that he was the Prime Minister. The, the converse of that, of course, is that he's no longer the Prime Minister and his Labour Party is no longer in power. It's the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats who now govern this country. So to a certain extent, they have political cover. They can say, well, this was a, a, previous, a previous government. On the other hand, uh, it obviously involved the intelligence services. They are, if you like, British civil servants, and many of them, of course, are still working for the civil service, the people who would have been uh, involved in these plans. It places them in a very difficult position, and I think there will be a lot of noise over, over the coming days, particularly because uh, a British newspaper is running with these allegations tonight. All right, Barnaby, for the moment, uh, many thanks indeed. Barnaby Phillips there, live in London. Well, let's take you straight back to Gaza now and uh, Shireen Tadros for more reaction to what we've heard. Shireen. Thanks, Adrian. Well, let me take you straight to our guest here, Ahmed Youssef, who is a Hamas member and also used to advise the deposed Prime Minister, Ismail Haniya. First of all, are you surprised by this document showing that there was a proposal by British intelligence to detain Hamas members? It's really outrageous. we really very sad uh, to hear that uh, and stunned to hear that the British themselves to be involved directly in, in interrogating the Palestinian uh, resistance people. This is something unacceptable and uh, this is really uh, shocking. To your knowledge, has this detainment by the British uh, intelligence service ever happened? We don't know exactly, but uh, unfortunately that we, we know that the British been involved in training the Palestinian security people in how to interrogate and investigate those people from the resistance, but directly to to hear from anybody that the, the British uh, intelligence MI6 being involved directly within in, in, in inquiry or investigating those people from the resistance or from Hamas uh, leader, we didn't hear anything like this. So there haven't been any suspected cases where you've thought that this could have happened? Until now, we didn't hear anything. But we know that the British all the time, they were there behind the scene training the Palestinian security people. Given that these documents will now be um, on, available on our website, you can have them, uh, what will you be doing in terms of approaching the British uh, Foreign Office, perhaps for a reaction or for clarification? Actually, we, we don't have an official uh, relation with the British, but I'm sure when the people will hear this information, 
on Al Jazeera, and uh, it's going to be the, the, the story that everybody will talk about it. And this is, will complicate the British relation with the Arab and Muslim countries who really do believe in Hamas and do believe in the Palestinian resistance. And that's why the, the British will be in big trouble with the world uh, Muslim community. What would your message be to uh, the British intelligence services? Actually, we hope that the British will change their um, uh, policy of divide and, and rule because this is well complicated Palestinian Palestinian relation. And instead of helping the Palestinian uh, to uh, be united and ending their division and having national reconciliation, we see the British try to make a deep divide between the Palestinians themselves. Ahmed Youssef, thank you very much for joining us. Well, we expect a lot more Hamas reaction uh, throughout the course of this hour. Of course, we'll keep you up to date. But from uh, for now, back to you, Adrian. Sure, many thanks. Let's get some more analysis uh, now on what we've heard from uh, our experts. Alistair Crook, who's in Beirut, and from Washington, D.C., Mark Perry. Uh, Alistair, why would the British intelligence services even think that they could suggest uh, such a plan, which in legal terms is at best highly dubious? Well, I think the impetus for this change uh, in direction, because let's be clear, and I was working for the European Union as an advisor to Solana at this time, European policy until this point and after this point was that all parties had to be included if there was to be a, a solution to the Palestinian conflict. It required Hamas to be brought in. And during those years, indeed, Hamas contributed considerably to those attempts to de-escalate violence and to a hoodness that, that took place. But what this decision, which certainly came under pressure from President Bush on, on uh, Mr. Blair, was a, an important one which had far-reaching, far more than just simply the question of the internment of Hamas, because it effectively wrong-footed, wrong-footed the European Union for the coming decade. Because what it did, in a sense, was prepare and put the European Union in a, in a, in a false position. Uh, Alistair, it still uh, was talking. Alistair, the, the, the papers reveal that the EU wanted to engage with, uh, with, with Hamas. Uh, let, let me quote from, from the papers. On March 21, 2006, EU envoy Mark Ott told Saib Arakat, quote, the EU has to deal with the reality of a Hamas government. In this respect, the EU position is different to the US. He then goes on to say, the US wants a Hamas government to fail. The EU will encourage Hamas to change and will try to make things work as much as possible. So, my question, would the EU not be a more honest broker? To what extent is the quartet preventing uh, the EU from taking a more, more proactive and, and perhaps productive role in the peace process? Uh, and this is precisely what happened uh, with this change of policy because effectively it tied in uh, the European security policy, particularly some European states, into a war against Hamas and against Islamic Jihad and against the Palestinian Rini, taking one side uh, against the other. Of course, what happens next? We have elections in 2006, and Hamas wins the election. Well, of course, the consequences of actually having already declared a war and your objective at a security level of trying to destroy and dismantle Hamas and Islamic Jihad. And then at another level, talking about the need for them to be included in the process, created a, a schizophrenia uh, within the European Union. They're talking the talk of reconciliation. They're talking the talk of, if you like, an inclusive settlement that brings in everyone. But at another level, they're going in the opposite direction. They're actively participating in a campaign to try and destroy the opposition to one of the Palestinian parties. Uh, okay. And that has haunted it not only yeah. in 2006, but subsequently as let, well. Let me bring in Mark Perry. Mark, from, from the exchange that I just read uh, from the, the papers there, it's clear that the US and the EU disagree fundamentally on the approach to dealing with, with what are political realities uh, on the ground. Why is it that the US position always trumps any other? The EU's more pragmatic ap approach, for instance. Yes, well, it, it, that's very true. After 2006, you can see a change in the documents, in the Palestine Papers, in the tone of what General Dayton is saying. Before the Hamas election, General Dayton is saying, it's our goal to, uh, to break up criminal gangs, to impose law and order. Suddenly, there's a change in tone after 2006. Suddenly, 
the target is Hamas, and it's suppressing political dissent and fighting terrorism, is the way he puts it. The EU falls in line because, frankly, General Dayton is there on the ground. The, uh, the Bush administration is flexing its muscles. The EU doesn't want to have any daylight between their policy and American policy. And sadly, the EU nations just fell in line. They're, they don't have an independent voice now, and the situation on the ground is being controlled in the peace process. It's being controlled by the United States. All right. Gentlemen, for the moment, uh, many thanks. We'll be back with you uh, a little later. You're with Al Jazeera and the Palestine Papers looking at an extraordinary cooperation in the fight against Hamas, including reigning in resistance through religion. The Palestinian Authority's assurance to Israel about controlling the message from the mosques. Plus, anger at Al Jazeera. Top Palestinian officials say they're the victims of a smear campaign. Hello again, this is an Al Jazeera Network special on the Palestine Papers. And uh, here's a quick reminder of what the papers actually are. They are the largest leak of confidential files in the history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. A cache of documents from a decade of negotiations between the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority and the U.S. There are 1,676 secret documents in total. Minutes of meetings, internal emails, reports studies, notes, maps, and draft agreements. Now, on this program, we've been presenting evidence of collusion between Israel and Palestinian Authority security forces. More on that is coming up. But first, highlights from the first two days of revelations. Now, Palestinian Authority negotiators offered Israel the biggest Jerusalem ever. We revealed in our first program annexing every settlement in East Jerusalem bar one. Chief PA negotiator Saib Arakat offered to, quote, be creative in talks over the Haram al-Sharif, Islam's third holiest site. And Palestinian negotiators were willing to trade the right of return for millions of refugees in exchange for peace with Israel and their own state. Well, the Palestinian Authority has come in for plenty of criticism from some quarters following our release of the Palestine Papers, but PA President Mahmoud Abbas has been given a hero's welcome as he arrived back in the West Bank. <laughs> Thousands came out to meet him in Ramallah and to protest against Al Jazeera. Abbas was in Cairo to meet the Egyptian president when news of the Palestine papers broke. Abbas told his supporters Al Jazeera had used fake documents to try to discredit his government. <laughs> You are the ones who have given and still give us legitimacy and we believe in legitimacy and in our rights and no one will force us. No one in this world can force us to give up an inch of our land or concede on the issues of refugees or the issue of Jerusalem. The primary national premise we declare now and we would die without it, Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine. Meanwhile, the two leading Palestinian negotiators have also questioned the integrity of Al Jazeera's coverage. Saib Arakat and Ahmed Korea both feature strongly in the Palestine papers. Supporters in Arakat's hometown of Jericho gave him a warm welcome on his return from Cairo, where he was accompanying Abbas. Arakat, along with Korea, has accused Al Jazeera of dirty tactics. We are facing the most severe smear campaign in history of journalism. Al Jazeera is saying that we are guilty until we get executed, and after our execution, we should un get an unfair trial. That's called neutral journalism 2011 Jazeera style. I challenge Al Jazeera to publish the Palestinian official papers and positions on Jerusalem, borders, settlement, refugees, and all other issues. As we're starting to achieve more recognition in the world for Palestinian national rights, for an independent state with East Jerusalem as its capital, this campaign came. So we ask ourselves, what is the interest of Al Jazeera and what is the interest of Qatar in the campaign against us? So support in the West Bank for the Palestinian Authority, but a different story in Gaza. Around 200 people rallied against 
the PA in response to a call from Hamas, which controls the Gaza Strip. Well, Shireen Tadros joins us once again live from uh, Gaza. Now, quite a contrast there in the size of, of gatherings uh, on the West Bank in Ramallah and there in Gaza, Shireen. Yeah, absolutely. Before I tell you about that, though, Adrian, let me just tell you about a little uh, development because the Aqsa Martyr Brigades have given uh, a press conference to uh, talk about the Madhoun assassination, and they've made it very clear that they do not blame Israel for uh, Hassan Madhoun's assassination. Uh, they, sorry, they blame Israel for uh, Madhoun's assassination. They do not blame the Palestinian Authority. Of course, the uh, Aqsa Brigades are, of course, the armed wing of Fatah. Also, uh, Hamas are calling for their supporters to go to Jabalia, which is in the northern Gaza Strip, and show solidarity uh, with the family of Hassan Madhoun. Uh, people, we understand, are gathering in quite large numbers uh, in that, just outside the family home. Now, as you were saying there, uh, in Gaza City, there was a rally just a few hours ago called by Hamas. The main message uh, at that rally by Hamas members who were speaking uh, to the to their people. Uh, they were telling them that this really just gives weight, all these revelations give weight to this argument that the Palestinian Authority have sold out the Palestinian cause, that negotiations uh, are not the way forward, they're not the way uh, to peace, and that resistance is the only way really to liberate the Palestinian people. If people there uh, in, in that rather small uh, demonstration are angry about what's been revealed uh, in the papers uh, up to today. What do you think their reaction will be once they've digested what we've revealed in, in the past hour or so? Well, I think people here in Gaza have long si uh, f felt, really, that the Palestinian uh, Authority has forgotten them and they feel completely isolated from any kind of negotiations that have been taking place. Uh, they hear a lot about the issue of settlements, the issue of the right of return of Palestinian refugees outside the territories. What they don't hear about is the uh, Gaza siege and any efforts uh, by the Palestinian Authority to lift the siege here in Gaza, which has caused uh, such misery for one and a half million people for over three years so uh, I think that they uh, feel like they're victims really of this internal struggle between Hamas and Fatah and all of these uh, revelations all of these documents really just add weight to that feeling all right Shireen for the moment uh, many thanks indeed Shireen Tadros live uh, in uh, Gaza now there has been a lot of reaction uh, to uh, all of this from all over the world online for more on that let's cross to our web desk and Greg Karlstrom Adrian, it's been an overwhelming reaction on the web so far. Our site actually went down briefly because of all the traffic, but the documents are still online, along with a lot of comment and analysis. So on this, the third day of releases, thousands of people voicing their opinions on Twitter, on Facebook, on their blogs. We'll take a quick run through some of what they had to say. First, on Twitter, Wolf Corker and Matt wrote in, picked out a quote of now opposition leader Tsipi Livni. She said, I'm a lawyer, but I am against law. He remarked, you don't see many quotes as revealing of the speaker's perspective as that one. On Facebook, Andy Gregg wrote in, he said, so much for all the Israeli lies about Palestinians not being prepared to negotiate a compromise during and after Camp David. And then again on Twitter, Sate Hamza wrote in, said anyone who is so shocked or surprised by the Palestine papers didn't really have a good understanding of the so-called peace process. Of course, a reminder, all of the documents are on our website, transparency.aljazeera.net. We'd love to hear from you. You can make comments and read reaction on Twitter using the hashtag Palestine Papers. And then we're on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Al Jazeera. Back to you, Adrian. Great, many thanks. Now, on to the next revelation from the Palestine Papers. It's a key exchange where Israel lays out strict guidelines for security forces in a Palestinian state. Forces designed solely to police Palestine citizens rather than defend its borders. Al Jazeera's specialist on the Palestine Papers, Clayton Swisher, takes us through it. So on May 27, 2008, the Palestinians and Israelis sit down in Jerusalem to talk about the core issue of security. It's Eric Cotton Korea, the lead Palestinian negotiators, and Sivi Livni, the Israeli foreign minister and senior advisor, Amos Galad. They're discussing the extent to which a future Palestine would be armed, or more likely not. They start by talking about a Palestinian army. First, demilitarization, what you call limited arms. The equation is that on one hand, you will have some limited arms for law and order and for fighting internal terrorism. But there is no need, and we cannot afford, a Palestinian army. 
My question is, why are you concerned about Palestinians more than the other neighbors? You don't make these demands on them. Without the militarization, your strategic depth will be bigger than ours. The way we look at the Middle East, your army contradicts our basic understanding of security. So in spite of Palestinian protests, it's clear Israel will not allow Palestine to have an army. Korea is later asked how he sees the situation on the ground, and he in turn asks who can guarantee Palestinian security. We have a confrontation with Hamas after they made an illegal coup. So as you see it, Lebanon with Hezbollah militia, it is possible that Lebanon will be under control of Hezbollah tomorrow morning. You can say it already is. Do I have a choice of who to place on my territory? No. Can I choose where I secure external defense? No. In order to create your state, you have to agree in advance with Israel. You choose not to have the right of choice afterwards. These are the basic pillars. So Livni makes it absolutely clear there. The basic pillars are no army, no air force, basically no capacity for external defense. And Korea makes it clear his confrontation is principally with Hamas. They go on to talk about maybe allowing another country to police Palestine's border, but on internal security, the Israelis are happy for the PA to have a strong police state. Are you ruling out a third party? There are many examples of third party presence. There will be perhaps a third party role, but not a military role. No tanks with any flags, including Israeli flags. So no agreement with an army regardless? Strong police for law and order, but not external threats. The border is with Jordan. You think Jordan is a threat? Not a threat. Is it a threat to you today? Usually when you fear external threats, it's from a neighbor. We are strategic allies, but radical movements are an increasing risk to us. Do you see your army in our territory? We don't see ourselves in the territory except for limited cases like early warning stations and the Jordan Valley. The Jordan Valley not as territory, but a presence at the border. Jordan is not a threat because they really believe in peace. And the basic pillar of this is security. So the Israelis, the leaders of the Middle East's only so-called democracy, point the Palestinians to the example of Jordan. Now, Human Rights Watch said in 2008 that torture is widespread and routine in Jordanian jails. Yet as the Israelis happily note, Jordan is peaceful externally, especially at its borders. But it is absolutely clear the country of Palestine would have no military capabilities beyond its own limited borders. Instead, the Israelis would far prefer to see Palestine born as a police state. Well, the notion of a peacekeeping force was mentioned there, but just how practical is that? Well, Clayton spoke with uh, U.S. Army Colonel P.J. Derma, recently retired from uh, the, uh, the Army in the U.S., who dealt directly with, with both Israeli and Palestinian security forces. The Israelis, by their culture and their history, are, have always been loath to have any third party because it, the main reason is it limits their, their reach. Yeah, they just cannot do what they think they need to do to defend the citizens of Israel and or the settlers. So having a third party on the ground, particularly a European one and God forbid an American one, would be quite a conundrum for them. Palestinians really don't want any outside help. They don't want any, any outside entity as well, and that's based upon the nature of the Middle East and also from the fact they've had a lot of outside help over time, USSC included. And as you raised, today, we've talked about today, what exactly really does it mean? Do we have a new security force or is it really something other, more darker? So putting something out there in, 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 uh, in upon these two parties <clears throat> would be very, very, I think, a very difficult prospect. Because until you get the political margin set, until you get the political condition set, you're not going to force it with a military presence, particularly in this arena. History has shown it. History has proved it. And the attitudes of those on the ground also make, make it quite clear. I think it would be incredibly difficult to go to that next level or or if you had to do that you would need such a large force that it would it would it would just be too large for the environment you're in and you'd, you'd have a pseudo third party military state again almost more back to the european example than than iraq or afghanistan now on to our final revelation on this program that exactly how far the palestinian authority was willing to go to prove that it's got the west bank under control even the messages from the mosques are being closely monitored. Barnaby Phillips has the story. 
teaching the imams of tomorrow to be on message. At this religious school, funded by the Palestinian Authority, they warn against extremism and incitement. A message of moderation, but it shows how the authority is tightening its control over religion, and that suits its political ends. The Prime Minister is doing everything possible to build the institutions. We are not a country yet, but we are the only ones in the Arab world who control the zakat and the sermons in the mosques. We are getting our act together. Here on the West Bank, the Israelis share that concern with the Palestinian Authority, that religious extremism be kept under tight control. When the West Bank is weak, Iran will make efforts to weaken Jordan. The West Bank is important and can cause more danger because it's closer to Israel. If in two weeks we let the West Bank become Hamastan or Anarchistan, this will affect Jordan and will open the doors for Iran. Sheikh Hamid Bitawi of Hamas is the kind of preacher that Israel fears. He doesn't recognize its right to exist. And now, like many others, He's been banned from preaching by the Palestinian Authority. So, is he guilty of incitement? Not at all. Incitement against whom? Against the occupation? Yes, we incite. That's clear. We incite. This is an ugly occupation. We must resist it. Resistance has many forms, and we resist through words. Some 200 imams have been replaced and all West Bank mosques are now told what sermons to deliver. The Palestinian Authority says it's protecting unity and stopping messages of hatred. But this clampdown suggests a future Palestinian state might not be so free after all. Barnaby Phillips, Al Jazeera on the West Bank. Well, let's get the thoughts of uh, our experts on this, beginning with uh, Akiva Eldar in uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, is a Palestinian state that, uh, that places restrictions on freedoms and rights the, the only sort of Palestine that Israel could envisage making peace with? Well, uh, I, I believe that uh, the current government uh, doesn't really see the uh, Palestinian full-fledged government taking over security and managing uh, it, the life of the uh, entire Palestinian population. Uh, we are looking at more than 300,000 settlers that are not going anywhere right now. So um, this is a very theoretical question, I'm afraid. But um, the problem is, and you, when you read the documents, it comes up, is the lack of symmetry. I think that uh, the, the bottom line is that it's impossible to reach an agreement between the occupier and the occupee without a third party. Somebody has, a, we need uh, a responsible adult to come up and say, this is a blueprint. Uh, we are not willing to hear about uh, this idea that Israel will keep occupying the territories while there is a Palestinian state. It cannot exist. Um, I, I believe that uh, uh, both the Israelis, the Palestinians, and uh, the, the uh, Europeans have to come to the Americans and say, you have to decide if it's an American interest, as President Obama keeps saying, to put an end to the conflict, you have to come up with some bridging ideas. Yeah. If not, you know, we will yeah. keep dragging our feet and we're getting nowhere, and things will deteriorate. because. If the uh, Palestinian Authority will give up on security, there will be more terrorism. And if it, there is more terrorism, Israel will retaliate, and there will be more casualties yep. and more fatalities oh. on the other side. OK, L let me bring in Ab Abdul Bari Atwan, the editor-in-chief of, uh, of Al Quds Al Arabi, who's uh, with me here in the studio. Uh, the Palestine papers show uh, Chief Negotiator Saeb Arakat basically telling uh, the US envoy George Mitchell that the PA has control over sermons in the mosques as well as control of the charities in the, in the West Bank, as we learned in Barnaby's report. Now, these are the sorts of restrictions that you'd associate with a police state. Yes. What does that tell us of how free or democratic a, a future Palestine might be? Well, actually, this is an insult 
to the Western world, to the donors' country, who suppose actually to set up independent, democratic, but, viable but, state. But doesn't the PA have to take these measures in order to fulfil its its obligations un, under the roadmap to you yes. know to fight terror, dismantle the infrastructure of terror? Yes, but what they gain in return: more settlement, more humiliation, and the end of the peace process. That's, that's the problem. If they gain something, if the Israeli committed themselves to the other side or their obligations of the roadmap, okay, maybe it, it is equal here, and it may, but it doesn't worth it yeah. to kill people in order actually to please your occupier. One final question. I'm going to have to ask you to be brief. To what extent have the roadmap obligations become a cover for the PA to crush its political rivals? Yes, you know, it was used and it was supported by the West. It seems, you know, those people who are supporting the PA wants actually to crush Hamas, the opposition, and create in the end a police state, not actually independent democratic state. That's, that's, everybody knows about this. So, in, 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 in the Palestinian side. So the, PL, the, the PA, the Palestinian Authority actually lost the plot. Now they are actually ended with nothing. Just, just the, the, the image tarnished. They were exposed in, in the eyes of their own people. All right. Abdul Bari Atwan, many thanks indeed. You're watching day three of an Al Jazeera network special. Coming up on the final installment of the Palestine Papers, the fallout from the Gaza war. I'm Mike Hanna in Gaza, where the dead of Israel's war lie buried. New details reveal that in a deal with the United States, it was the Palestinian Authority that stalled the process that could have brought those responsible to justice. Plus, we have more leaked documents showing the Palestinian Authority was tipped off about the Israeli offensive, a war that was to claim nearly 1,500 lives. We hope to see you again tomorrow. Remember, you can read it all for yourself. Just go to transparency.aljazeera.net and follow the instructions. We're back with the next release of the Palestine Papers at 20 hours GMT on Wednesday. I'm Adrian Finnegan. This is Al Jazeera.